um, welcome to, to RAID speakers. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I will just um, briefly introduce um, you all <coughs> for the benefit of our delegates. So um, Dr. Safu, Safa Uslu, beg your pardon, um, who is head of department for international relations at the Digital Transformation Office for the Presidency of the Republic of Turkey. Hello, Dr. Uslu, thank you for joining us. Um, we have um, Isidro Lazo Balasteros, who's the cabinet expert for Maria Gabriel's Office of Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and Youth at the European Commission. Um, Anna Lisa Panalas. Um, Anna Lisa is the advisor for digital affairs at the Department of European Union and International Cooperation at the Estonian Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications. Um, we have Anu Talus. Thank you for joining us, Anu. Um, Anu is the Ombudsman at the Office of Data Protection for Finland. And um, last but by no means least, um, from the OECD, we have Antonio Capogaban Capobianco, who's the acting head of um, competition um, division at the OECD. So thank you um, to all of you for joining us. Um, so um, there's a few topics we're going to cover here. We're, we're talking about policy, we're talking about innovation, um, international data flows and competition. Uh, but to, to start off, let's let's focus on the topic of policy and, um, and the role that science and research plays in informing policy. We've talked a lot today about how policy um, should be developed. Um, but why is it important for policymakers to listen to the new generation of innovators and how can we make sure that we do so? Um, Isidro, perhaps this uh, might be a question for you in your, your role as um, expert on innovation, research, culture, education and youth at the European Commission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben, for the, for the introduction for the, and for the question. Indeed, when we are talking about innovation, we need to, to be aware that we are moving into a new generation of innovation that is not necessarily linked to research or to the transfer of research results, and that is very much linked to the new generation of innovators. The startups, uh, in, uh, investors, VCs, business angels. So these are uh, players who didn't exist in Europe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or, or they were marginal at that moment, but certainly they are at the core of innovation in Europe nowadays. We can just think on, on the, the company who came with the solution for the Fed vaccine for, for COVID. That was a startup, a biotech startup, and, and so on and so forth. So this is a, a reality. At the same time, this um, new generation of innovators, they don't have uh, lobby groups in Brussels that allow us to, 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 to easily listen to them. And uh, they, they are extremely busy, extremely occupied to pay, to spend time on writing position papers or anything like that. So what we have done in the European Commission and the Commissioner Gabriel has done in particular is to go outside and to reach out to them. So she, the, the Commissioner Gabriel has uh, set up a group of 33 unicorns the founders of those 33 unicorns who had the headquarters in Europe. So that they are not, uh, not necessarily founded by Europeans, but the headquarters are here in Europe. So we we have, uh, the commissioner has met with this, uh, the founders of the, un the unicorns. The unicorns, as you know, is the startups with a valuation of more than 1,000 million euros or dollars. And uh, then uh, in addition to that, the commissioner has set up another group of uh, innovation ecosystem leaders, one representative from every member state, so 27. And another uh, working group with the uh, women VC uh, partners. In all cases, we have received recommendations or requests for recommendations from these groups. The commissioner has requested the services uh, to analyze this: the education department, the research department, the, the joint research center uh, department of the commission, to analyze those requests and to see what can be done and what cannot be done in the in the short term. So we have identified several things that can be done in the short term and will be in the in the World Program 2022 and others that are more for the for the long term. But this is just an example of how it, we want that the new innovation regulation is really fitting to this new generation of innovators. We need to get outside our comfort zone and to reach out to them. This generation of innovators, they don't have the traditional job, uh, lobby groups and they are not part of the Chamber of Commerce and this traditional counterparts for policy makers. So we, it's, it's a bit more difficult for us, but it certainly is the only way forward. We want to really uh, be re uh, credible players uh, in terms of innovation. We need to get out of that. And, uh, and the, the, the fact, for example, that the commissioner Gabriel met these unicorns is the very first time that any commissioner in the EU has met the unicorns of Europe. 
we have seen that in, with Obama, with Trump, and uh, even with with um, with uh, Joe Biden, we will see for sure how they are meeting with these founders of the of the big uh, tech companies in in in, in the U.S. But this has never happened in Europe, and the Commissioner Gabriel is opening a pathway that we hope will be followed by all the other uh, policy makers in, in Europe, in the member states, so that they, they, they listen to them and they, and they, they realize that the, the needs of these pledges are very different from the needs of the research departments or, or from the list or the, the needs of the researchers or the, or the corporates. So they are very special uh, type of, of, of people and we need to, to pay special attention to them. Thank you, Isidro. And, and um, presumably the, the self-expressed um, needs of these unicorns will, will be heard by, by the policymakers who are, who are developing the, for instance, the AI Act or the, the Digital Services Act in, in the European Union. Uh, presumably these, um, the, the views of, of um, the, the startups um, and, the, and the, these 33 unicorns that you speak of as well. Um, is, is that specifically, the, uh, presumably they're, they're companies involved in technology and, um, and, and this is being fed into the development of technology regulation? So we, we, uh, we are thinking in, in this intensive regulation beyond AI and we are thinking on deep tech. So AI for yeah. us is the the ice of the of the of the ice, the, the the peak of the iceberg, and we see coming more challenging technologies to be regulated. We can easily think of synthetic biology, where we are getting new things that are in between human beings and non-human beings. So how to regulate those things are going to be really really challenging for us. And in all those, yeah. in, in all these cases, we are taking the in, in, uh, on board the comments from not only from the unicorns, but as I said, also from the from the ecosystem leaders that who have also uh, because these 27 ecosystem leaders they all know very well what is happening in their 27, mm -hmm. uh, 27 um, uh, ecosystems and uh, national ecosystems, and they are all informing us on this new regulation that we need to prepare. Thank you very much, Isidro, for, for clarifying that. Um, so, um, from a, an international perspective, looking sort of um, above and beyond the, the EU, um, Antonio, um, <clears throat> what would you say is the most important consideration when it comes to international cooperation? Is it the making of rules itself? Is it, is it sort of international conversations about how to develop rules, what rules should be developed, or, or is it how those rules are enforced? Is it the enforcement of regulation and policy or is it the development of uh, policy and regulation? Well, th thank you, Ben. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, but first of all, let me say that I'm really grateful for the invitation and deeply honored to share this panel with such an esteemed uh, set of panelists. Now, for your question, I think you won't be too surprised if I tell you that we believe, we strongly believe that international cooperation is key to ensuring consistent approach both to designing new regulation, to setting standards in the digital economy, uh, and in enforcing uh, national regulatory regimes. And we look at this, I particularly look at this from the perspective of competition laws, enforcing competition laws uh, to cross border cases. I'm not, I'm not saying this just uh, because the, I come from the OECD, which has made of cooperation. I would say an integral part of its uh, of its DNA of its core uh, mandate. We are we are clearly facing global phenomena. Digitalization uh, is clearly a cross border phenomena. Players are truly global. Uh, business models are global. Uh, but government interventions, whether regulatory on the regulatory side or on the enforcement side, are by definition domestic. They are, uh, you know they apply, they design, and they apply. Uh, uh, local local laws and, and, and regulations. So international cooperation really is the bridge between these global phenomena, which potentially raise common concerns in different jurisdictions, and and solutions, a regulatory solution or enforcement solution. Now, uh, just to to um, to clarify, what we strive for is really a consistent approach, or consistent approaches across jurisdiction, not necessarily identical approaches. So we do recognize uh, that there may, different, there may be different solution in different jurisdictions about the same, same questions or the same concerns. Uh, but I, I, trying to strive for consistent approach really requires coordination to ensure that business can benefit of a regulatory environments where they can thrive, they can plan for investments, uh, they can 
develop the next wave of innovative services uh, across the jurisdiction. So you know, divergent approaches really risk of chilling uh, incentives to do so. And that's why I think cooperation, we really believe in international cooperation as the, the, the tool that allows governments to exchange views and to develop uh, consistent solutions. Thank you, Antonio. Yes, um, likewise, uh, at RAID, we very much believe in, in the power of um, international dialogue to, 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 um, to help mutual understanding and, um, and work towards solutions. Um, but it's, it's easier said than done sometimes, isn't it? And, and it, I'd be very interested to hear um, a perspective from, um, from Safa Uslu on um, how, how do you think that um, governments and regulators would like to work together, for example, on the, the issue of um, the development of artificial intelligence you know what what are the practical ways that that different um, jurisdictions can look to work closely together and to find shared approaches and where the global economy can't be regulated by any one country how can regulators deal with areas where they might sort of disagree and have different attitudes uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Everson and distinguished panelists. Uh, I would like to express my pleasure to join you in this uh, particular panel in international cooperation. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, say something about our office. Uh, so our office established in, was established in 2018 and uh, we uh, recently, uh, as a regulatory site, as a particular focus on government, we recently published Turkish Turkey's na uh, first national uh, artificial intelligence strategy. Uh, so uh, within this strategy, we are paying attention, uh, considerably paying attention to international collaboration in the field of AI as well. So within this perspective, coming to your question, uh, with the rise of AI and its disruptive uh, impact across a wide range of issues, uh, this poses new challenge to policymakers and other stakeholders around the globe. Uh, we look at the questions pertaining to trustworthiness, robustness, ethics, regulation, and governance in order to ensure that the potential malign consequences of AI are controlled and benefits fairly uh, distributed. By now, many countries, as you know, uh, have also brought uh, forward their uh, own AI strategies, often with uh, direct uh, reference to the international level, uh, and questions of global AI governance. While each strategy uh, accentuates its own distinct strengths, all countries wish to lead the race and all countries claim to be leading the, you know, at least some aspect of the technology already. For instance, AI talent research, startups, uh, software, hardware applications, so on and so forth. On the other hand, uh, at the international level, many existing cooperation initiatives already touch upon uh, those matters that are directly or indirectly related to the concerns pertaining to AI. Uh, so these initiatives have uh, distinct or overlapping ways, uh, we believe that, uh, working mandates, established procedures and resident actors involving a delineated region uh, like the EU or having broader outreach like G20, uh, that includes uh, Russia and China. Thus, uh, the fragmented overlapping uh, landscape that emerged from this exercise is an immature field as the AI itself. Uh, so within this perspective, yet uh, we observe a rapid progress and first sign of consolidation and convergence towards an AI regulation with the help of harmonizing power of a globalized market. While these alone valuable initiatives so the question is, do we need a focused transnational meta-governance which would entail a binding legislation rather than political declarations, ethical principles, guidelines or partnerships? Uh, so, uh, in other words, does value-based and principle suggestions should also be translated into a functional system of, uh, of rules, binding agreements and international governance mechanism that go beyond voluntary self-commitments or national AI strategies. So not surprisingly, this kind of cooperation process will be influenced by the actors around the table as well as by the type of table. And of course, these are questions which are open for discussions and cannot be answered right away. Uh, but although uh, the existing global cooperation efforts are crucial in addressing AI risk 
and governance challenge. It is a fact that they remain limited to a certain part of the world and may exclude some big players in the field. Uh, so, uh, as I'm finishing my word uh, concisely, I would like to uh, briefly mention again, uh, we need a multilateral platform and a global stewardship with numerous actors in a deeply fragmented cyber regime complex, which also involves a meaningful representation from developing nations and underserved communities that are most vulnerable to AI-driven disruptions. So uh, basically, uh, this can be my response, uh, Mr. Avison. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Islu. Um, yeah, I think um, you, you seem to be saying, um, amongst many other things, that, that we can't just leave it to. I think you referred to the harmonizing force of global market forces, which, which clearly do do um, create have some sort of um, leveling and self determining effect on on the way that um, the, the products and services are shaped. Um, but but you're absolutely right um, that there needs to be international dialogue, and not just the the, the, the G7, the G20, but um, because it, everybody's lives um, are touched by technology and not everyone has access to it either. And, and yeah, that, that poses issues as well. Um, so uh, moving to um, Estonia um, now, Annalisa, um, how do you think that international cooperation can be strengthened on IA, AI or IA if you're French <laughs> um, to address common challenges? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me here. It's uh, it's a pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe if we talk about the international uh, cooperation on AI, uh, then we already have many organizations and also platforms that focus uh, exactly on that, how to uh, improve coordination, how to share best practices, also key policy recommendations, and so on. And well, this is somewhat easier on the on EU level, for example. One of the main aspects of the recent uh, AI proposal that is on the table today is, is also to offer a, a horizontal framework and conditions for AI systems uh, in order to avoid market fragmentation that could uh, potentially happen uh, when countries start to uh, implement various uh, national frameworks and, and these in turn could, uh, could make it difficult for businesses to operate and, and offer AI-based uh, services. But um, but when we when we look at the global picture, it uh, it becomes more complicated. I mean, overall, it seems uh, that there is a growing consensus, at least among like-minded countries, that uh, the AI will bring benefits, but also that it entails some uh, some risks, and that these uh, risks uh, need to be managed. And uh, well, these problems and concerns are are usually quite similar. But uh, there can be differences in ways how to uh, best uh, approach these issues. So this is exactly the place where uh, cooperation and coordination with, uh, with other countries and partners the globe is needed uh, to find common ground on, on topics where it is possible and also to, uh, to facilitate uh, discussions on, uh, on uh, where, where mutual understanding is uh, a bit harder to reach. So, for example, um, uh, it seems that uh, the EU and US uh, Trade and uh, Technology Council that was uh, recently established uh, could potentially have um, have a role in uh, facilitating these uh, discussions on AI at a transatlantic uh, level. For example, on uh, on various standards or, uh, related to AI or or ways to uh, assess risks or uh, AI systems, for example but also potentially uh, best ways to implement the AI-based based, uh, technologies uh, in various sectors. So um, since we have somewhat uh, different approaches when it comes to regulating AI uh, working towards, um, let's say, achieving the compatibility of frameworks, uh, definitely be very useful. And I believe that it's, it's not necessary to, to uh, have full alignment. This is not even realistic. But, but we should rather focus on a uh, uh, pragmatic approach and, and try to find as many common um, common aspects and, and nominators as possible. Therefore, to, to try the object of AI, build our capacities on both AI governance and, and positive implementation, 
and also to share best practices because I think this is very useful for, for our counterparts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annalise. So, um, moving on to the, the topic of, of innovation now, this is a panel um, about sort of building this on shared interest to, to manage the risks and benefits of, of innovation. Um, I'm thinking of the, the example of, of, of GDPR, which is an example of um, how um, it was, okay, EU wide, but it's, it's been adopted slightly more widely than that. But do we still have um, Anu Talos on the line? I was going to ask her a question. She's offline. Okay, no problem. Um, so on the topic of innovation, Isidro, um, how would you describe the EU's attitude to innovation? Um, is there too much emphasis on regulation and not enough on innovation, as is sometimes said? I mean, I don't know if you heard the um, Sean Heather from the US Chamber of Commerce earlier on. Um, you know, he just sort of seemed to be saying um, best left businesses um, get on with it. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of Perhaps overregulation is, is can be a bad thing for for for, for business. What's your, your your view on the the EU's attitude to innovation? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you very much for the question. Indeed, it's, this is a perception from many people that the EU is uh, very much focused on, on, on regulating the tech champions coming from elsewhere in the world. And Commissioner Gabriel uh, wants to put the focus on creating innovation champions in Europe as well. So it's mm -hmm. complementing to the to the regulatory approach. And the, our dream is that in the future we could have so many uh, innovation champions in Europe that this regulation of the EU would apply to these European uh, champions, not, not, not only to the non uh, big tech uh, companies that we all know. So for that uh, purpose, uh, the commissioner is taking a very bold approach on, uh, we are uh, um, talking on different aspects and, and we are taking the approach of the innovation ecosystem. So we are taking an ecosystem approach, horizontal one, not a vertical industrial ecosystem, but an horizontal uh, ecosystem in which we are, uh, the commissioner is bringing all the actors together. I mentioned to you a few before, but there are many of the actors and uh, here I would like to highlight the role of the university. So in this uh, new generation of, of innovators, we notice is that most of the founders of the big, most successful startups, they don't come from the research departments, but they come from the classrooms of the universities. And we all know many cases, like, uh, for example, the founder of Spotify, who started in the university, and he left the university to set up a Spotify. And like that is most of the cases. They are coming from, not, not dropping the universities, but they're certainly coming directly from the university. And this, this was already, 10 years ago in Cambridge University, which I have been fellow for many years. And this is now becoming a, the normal, the new normal in, in Europe. So this uh, new, uh, and then we want to, to work heavily with the, the university into innovation agents. So it's not a, a, an in, innovation engines for the, for the uh, local innovation ecosystems. So it's not that we are forgetting research in this new wave of innovation, it's that we are also in, 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 in encompasses only other sources of, of innovation. And we have the hope that with this uh, ecosystem approach, we will be able first to, 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 the, to, to get these big tech champions coming from, from Europe. Second, to be able to attract the right, the, the enough uh, 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 private money to, to, to support the startups uh, in Europe, in particular in the growth case, and to tackle the number one request from startups in Europe and in the world, that is access to talent. The big change from five years ago, mm -hmm. six years ago, is that the, the money is coming where the talent is, and before was the other way around. And this is a very, very interesting uh, uh, an opportunity for Europe because we have an excellent university system in, in Europe. And if we are able to transform these universities, not only into from, from educators and researchers into also engines of innovation, providing uh, the, the ecosystem for the students from the university to set up their own startups and providing the talent needed for these startups to, to grow up, we believe that we have the, the, the recipe to, 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 to get these big uh, tech champions coming from Europe. And from the, this is the talent that this is, is the number one thing. The other uh, request from the ecosystem, from the players, is that they need the linkages, the connections between the, the, the actors of the ecosystem. That's why the Commissioner Gabriel 
is coming with uh, her idea of this pan-European innovation ecosystem. And this is extremely mm -hmm. powerful because we believe that uh, uh, we might be able, through this combination of the two uh, elements, talent and the ecosystem approach, to attract also the, the private capital that we need in Europe. We need to, to attract more uh, uh, institutional investors in particular, uh, pension funds, mm -hmm. uh, 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 insurance companies, to invest into into business funds so that we are able to to, to bridge the gap that still exists in terms of funding in the scale of phase in particular for the startups in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Isidro. And um, moving now to to, um, to, to Safar Uslu, um, what, what's the view from the, the office of the, the, the president of Turkey about how um, regulation can be reformed and connected to businesses to realize the opportunities of um, technology such as artificial intelligence on industrial automation um, how is how is regulation and policy um, communicating with business uh, thank you thank you Abison. so uh, i will uh, be looking to this question from a bit uh, from the theoretical perspective though uh, so like uh, you know business companies for sure will be one of the stakeholders which will be impacted from those uh, regulations and uh, agreements we are now talking about the economic idea of first mover advantage that is about to be subjected to you know uh, regulations hence a new uh, playground for global uh, regulatory competition pushes governments to find the most appropriate balance between protection and innovation. I would like to explain this by an analogy. Uh, so the reasoning goes, you know, uh, as follows. Uh, if we start off from the looking perspective of game theory, uh, at the first stage, companies will start to abide to a foreign country's regulation in order to serve to its market, but then they would eliminate the domestic disadvantage by uh, lobbying the government of their base country to adopt similar requirements, ensuring that domestic companies have an acutely high burden of regulatory compliance. Eventually, the convergence of the regulations will be established in which one of those countries will be a rule taker rather than you know, a rule setter. To the extent such requirements are mandatory, both countries can prevent a company from selling an EI product or service according to its jurisdiction or alter the conditionally of the profit. Oh, hello. Hello, um, Serge Dagae. It's uh, nice to see you here, but we seem to have lost um, Safa Uslu um, mid, mid flow. I do apologize for um, the technical hitch there. Um, and um, Dr. Uslu is still not with us. Um, hopefully we will get him back online again shortly. Um, that was all extremely interesting. Um, hmm. Perhaps Annalisa, perhaps you could um, pick up on this question about um, innovation um, from the perspective of, of an EU member state. Um, how, how do you think um, we can find a balance between regulation and at the same time encourage digital innovation in a country like Estonia, which is a a, a very good example of an innovative um, community. Uh, yeah, you. definitely. Um, well, I believe that this is one of the questions, uh, and it's not an easy one, at least for us, um, because, well, advancements in technology definitely raise the question of uh, how to regulate new technologies or ensure safety and also make sure that uh, digital policy is adequately that it adequately uh, supports digitalization and, and also innovation. Well, in the EU, we have been looking for uh, for ways to uh, strengthen the digital single market. And, and in some areas, uh, we have been quite successful also uh, thanks to appropriate uh, regulation. Yes. Uh, and in other areas, well, there is still uh, a lot of work to be done. Uh, Thank you. And when it comes to... Is that new? Uh, oh, oh, seems like we have a little interference um, on the on the line. Yeah, um, okay. I hope to manage. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, I, can but I just you. wanted. Okay. Yeah, uh, is that um, I think uh, 
well, this applies to both public and private sector that, um, that it's important to build trust. And well, if you look at, uh, for example, the legislative agenda on the EU level, uh, then this is clearly one of the drivers for uh, for several proposals that are on the table today. For example, also the Artificial Intelligence Act or uh, our Data Governance Act and so on. So, so when it comes, let's say, finding balance between uh, regulation and innovation, well, I believe we should first regulate where there is clear need for it and and hmm. where there is a uh, existing framework for example in some areas we can also use guidelines that uh, explain the application of existing legal framework uh, instead of implementing new additional legislation perhaps so so we also have to make sure that we don't over regulate and that our business is uh, that our business environment uh, does not become too difficult for, for our startups for our smes um, especially when it's already quite difficult to scale up for them. But, uh, but that regulation and innovation should be in contradiction. What I mean is that they should uh, also, they can enable each other. And and it should not only be about matching risks. And, and maybe one concrete example, if we take the recent proposal on AI, well, then we at least see that it's important to, to um, keep and maintain this uh, risk-based approach that is uh, based on uh, objective criteria and uh, definitely avoid, uh, for example, classifying whole sectors as, as high risk. So I believe mm-hmm. there is um, quite quite good consensus that we, we have to make sure that AI systems that are that we place on the EU market are safe and trustworthy and, and they all uh, respect the fundamental rights. But we also have to make sure that the proposal will result in a competitive edge for our own companies and the European economy and not hinder the take up of uh, new technologies. And, uh, and to, to achieve this, uh, well, I think first we, the regulation should be quite uh, technology neutral, let's say, and the requ- requirements that we um, impose on high risk AI systems are mm-hmm. highly proportionate and also realistic, for example, let's say requirements for uh, data sets. And, mm. and last, um, also, I think it's only the one side of the coin. I mean, it's equ- equally important that we also um, uh, raise awareness uh, and, and skills. Uh, for example, when it comes to AI or data, we talk, we talk quite a lot about, um, about risks and all things <laughs> that could happen. And I definitely agree that we need to uh, manage all these uh, risks, but we should also focus maybe more on how we can use AI as an enabling technology and also share the positive narrative, and also the potential that this uh, technology uh, definitely brings to our lives. Absolutely. Thank you very much, um, Annalise, sir. And, and good good to see you um, back, um, Safa Uslu. I'm sorry we um, had a technical interruption there, but um, I'm very pleased that, that you're here. Um, and we broke you off mid-flow there. Um, was there anything that, that, that you wanted to add on, on this subject of, um, of um, stimulating yeah. sort of innovation? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Somehow, uh, I think uh, maybe the uh, firewall uh, blocked the uh, connection. I don't know what happened. But uh, maybe few words, last few words uh, regarding this question. Uh, so to achieve harmony between regulations and business, we suggest a holistic governance approach uh, along two dimensions, horizontally and vertically. And the first dimension is horizontal and aims at identifying minimum requirements to ensure trustworthy AI, considering all three environments, namely the system, data and infrastructure. On the other hand is uh, the concrete materialization of AI opportunities and risk is often linked to the domain in which it used, such as in energy, healthcare, transportation, or education. The horizontal uh, framework that was set above needs to be complemented by domain-specific cooperation initiatives. Thus, the second dimension is vertical, for which the cooperation effort should be tailored to the context or sector with a domain-specific expertise. This dimension uh, encompasses the areas where AI's risk must be prevented and minimized with more uh, immediate uh, urgency and the need for cooperation can arise in a more ad hoc fashion. We believe that uh, horizontal and vertical dimensions of AI governance should be 
address in parallel uh, as a result for identification of base requirements for a trustworthy AI and for strict addressing of high risk sectors, a particularly binding regulation will be the most appropriate governance mechanism to secure the aim sought for humanity. For uh, other low risk AI systems, however, different tools should be explored such as voluntary standards or uh, certification mechanisms, which of course take the personal data protection rules as well as other fundamental rights and freedoms into consideration. All in all, uh, for each dimension, we must think about uh, to which extent the business should be imposed to ex ante or uh, ex post rules and which entities should be responsible for the enforcement of such rules. And in uh, case something goes wrong, ensuring the availability of uh, accountability and redress mechanism. Uh, finishing my mm -hmm. response to question uh, by eliminating distortion of uh, competition and ensuring that all actors can cooperate such a level playing uh, field can stimulate uh, intensifies uh, beneficial AI research as well as innovation uh, and ensure that the benefits can be uh, accessed uh, by all uh, thank you Anderson. thank you so much um, dr Uslu. <clears throat> I'm glad you're able to to, to finish your, your your point there and um, so so to Bring bring that that into sort of the international context, um, Antonio. Um, what, what would your view be on how, how we can promote greater convergence on regulatory approaches? Um, for example, on antitrust enforcement. There was a, a, a panel earlier today about um, the the regu the regulation of, of firm technology platforms, and and um, yeah, every country has its own sort of laws and and, and attitudes to to sort of um, competition. Um, control. Um, so um, what's your view on how, how we could reach sort of greater alignment internationally um, without stifling innovation? Uh, thanks, Ben. It's the $1 million question. I think it's, it's a very interesting <laughs> issue you're facing. Uh, but the answer is not that uh, that uh, that easy. Uh, but, but there's one thing I, I sort of when it comes especially to promoting really convergence in, in um, designing regulatory frameworks. Uh, I think one thing I've learned here in my sort of years at DOCD is that finding consensus consensus on prescriptive rules is much harder than agreeing uh, on general principles, on guiding principles. And, and so I think you know when it comes to cooperation and, and, and in, in, in regulatory framework and negative approaches starting from agreeing on the general principles provides that overall sort of framework in which then governments and jurisdictions can develop the national the national rules within a consistent uh, um, approach and, and um, one example uh, that, that I uh, like to think of here is really on, on the OECD principles on artificial intelligence many have mentioned the, the, the efforts to, to regulate or to understand how uh, to use and, and to better use and provide incentives to innovate in, in, in artificial intelligence. There, I think the development of principle at the OECD level, I think, was very successful because it really informed uh, policy making uh, at national level, but without, I would say, straight jacketing the decision makers. And that, that I think, was a, it's, a good, so it's a good way to start in, pro, in promoting convergence, start from, from general principle. When it comes to cooperation and enforcement, and, and here really I, I think of um, uh, enforcement uh, of competition rules, of competition laws at national level, um, a lot of these cases, especially in digital economy, are cross border cases, they're global cases, they're looked at by a number of competition authorities around the world. Uh, so what we are trying to, to do here at the OECD especially is really to push uh, enforcement agencies, the competition authority, authorities to be far more ambitious than they are today and try to develop system for reducing the potentially very high number of parallel investigation of the same conduct, of the same merger, the same transaction in multiple jurisdictions, which is real the real concern when it comes to ensuring consistent consistent enforcement approaches. Now, we could discuss this a whole day, of, of course, but there's a number of ideas out there in terms of lead agencies, mm -hmm. deference, uh, and mutual recognition of decision by foreign enforcers. Uh, so that there are a lot of ideas out there which would require ambitious decisions. Uh, um, and I think the OCD is, is offering a platform for at least discussing those ideas. 
Thank you very much. I mean, the European Union is a, is a good example of, of how mutual recognition can can be applied um, to to um, <clears throat> to recognise um, existing legislation across um, across borders. Um, moving, speaking of crossing borders, let's move on to the topic of data flows. Um, so, um, perhaps Annalisa, you might be able to to give us a view on um, the the barriers to what what are the barriers to international digital trade and how we might overcome some of these. Uh, yeah, definitely. Well, I believe we can still see some barriers when it comes to uh, data flows and data economy in general. Um, and what we see is that the potential of data economy and international data flows has been um, quite widely acknowledged. And this is also the case in different EU level initiatives, uh, policy papers and uh, strategies. I mean, we have the Data Governance Act, we have uh, Data Act that is coming uh, in December, probably. And uh, it's also clear that cross-border data flows can have a huge um, positive uh, economic and also social impact. But but nevertheless, I mean, there are still several issues that, that we need to address to, to fully unlock this uh, potential. And uh, that we have been stressing, at least from, from Estonian side, uh, is the importance of uh, data availability, quality, but also cross-border interoperability. Um, and uh, for example, we could benefit uh, from uh, data standardization, meaning that uh, that the sharing of data um, based on common uh, standards and principles. So this would help to improve uh, data availability for reuse, for example, also strengthen our economy and also increase our resilience uh, to crisis, for example. So, and also uh, focusing, for example, on um, on different incentives of uh, how to encourage data sharing between sectors, across sectors, uh, could be very useful. Um, also, for example, addressing obstacles to a uh, free movement movement of data, um, avoiding unjustified uh, localization requirements. Uh, um, same applies, and well. In this regard, we we also hope for for good outcomes from the ongoing uh, negotiations um, between uh, EU and and US on the replacement of the privacy shield. So this mm -hmm. would definitely help to uh, minimize some burdens and ensure also clarity for our businesses as well as protect the rights of these indi individuals whose data is is being transferred uh, across the Atlantic. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, from from Estonian side, we are definitely following uh, negotiations closely, and and we are optimistic. Thank you very much, Annalisa. And, and um, m moving back to to Turkey, um, which is outside of the, um, the the European Union, of course. Um, what 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 would you say, um, Dr. Uslu, are the barriers from from your perspective to to international digital trade, and how are these being overcome from from a Turkish perspective? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Anson. I think uh, one of the major points here is the uh, data sharing, and uh, we are also working on it. Uh, so, uh, but uh, if you look at the broader perspective, when we talk about infamous digital trade and barriers, we come up with a fragmented picture. Although digital trade does not fall within the core uh, activities of uh, our office, we often encounter with the issue as it cuts vertically across many digital sectors. Uh, and at this point, many of the disruptive change underpinning the data-driven economy is uh, demanding regulatory solutions. Uh, thus, uh, states are using the venue of uh, preferential trade uh, agreements. Uh, I would like to uh, highlight the bilateral agreements here uh, to fill uh, in some of the gaps uh, addressing the new generation of trade barriers, uh, such as uh, data flows and data localization measures. Uh, countries uh, try to uh, catch this uh, or uh, uh, countries uh, try to uh, resolve from this problem in order to accommodate their demand for seamless digital trade. Unsurprisingly, the framework of those PTAs that has emerged and now regulates a contemporary uh, digital trade is not coherent. 
likewise the regulation frameworks uh, intended for AI, uh, only few issues such as uh, the ban on customs duties on electronic transmissions, electronic contracts, and uh, signatures and uh, paperless trading, uh, do we have some uh, level of convergence? Uh, we had uh, looked closer to, to the PTAs uh, globally uh, uh, within the bilateral agreements. 348 uh, PTAs entered into force between 2000 and 2020. 185 contain a provision relevant for digital trade. 110 have specific e-commerce provisions and 80 uh, have uh, dedicated uh, e-commerce e chapters. Uh, it should be underscored mm -hmm. that uh, the more advanced digital trade treaties uh, are still on a handful. Uh, the regulation of data and data flows has in recent years moved to the center stage due to the advanced technologies. However, uh, new types of solutions not only provide legal uncertainty for data-driven businesses, but also a policy space for the protection of vital domestic public interests. For example, uh, major stakeholders of the EU and the US have adopted different approaches with the, uh, regard to data protection, like, you know, uh, this is a GDPR I'm talking about, uh, and the new agreements such as the Regional uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, adopted by China are somewhere in between these two emerged models. Uh, it provides rules only for uh, conditional data flows while uh, preserving a lot of policy space for domestic policies, uh, which very well may arise from its different cultural uh, context, having a data protection's nature. Uh, the new, the next few years uh, will be critically uh, uh, and critical. Uh, I would like to mention here, and uh, in identifying solutions that uh, uh, adequately addressing demands of the data-driven economy. However, uh, among these initiatives, uh, the 2020 Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, uh, namely DEPA, uh, between Chile, New Zealand, and Singapore, seems like a unique project. Uh, in this sense, uh, it covers a broad range of issues that the digital economy uh, infringes upon with uh, extra features such as artificial intelligence and digital inclusion. Uh, besides, uh, this kind of uh, agreements offers a good basis for harmonization and interoperability of uh, domestic uh, frameworks and international cooperation that adequately takes into account the complex challenge of contemporary data governance. As a conclusion, I would like to reflect that agreement as DEPA or others uh, may, pave the, uh, may pave the way towards an exemplary uh, convert solutions for most of the countries in a few years' time, I believe. Thank you. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, Safa Uslu. Um, <clears throat> it's very interesting indeed. Um, moving back to the question of, um, of competition and, and the, the size of, of technology companies, um, Isidro, perhaps um, we, we could um, find out a bit more from your perspective about whether the European Union or Europe more broadly perhaps um, should, should try and compete with the US and China in the creation of big technology platforms. And when we're talking about technology platforms, the, the overwhelming majority of them are US and China has some very, very large tech companies, um, tech platforms as well. Europe has had some, you've, you've, you've mentioned before about the, that the, there, are, there are some that have emerged that have then, then been bought out by American companies. And um, is, is, you know, how can we stop this from happening? Do we need to stop this from happening? How can Europe, can, can Europe have a competitor to, to Facebook or, or Microsoft or, or even Google? I mean, is, is it desirable? necessary so the, possible so there are there are two um, two different waves of uh, startups one is the first one the digital startups that is the one that is getting most of the headlines and is the one where we are now and there is a new one coming that is the one about the deep tech startups and here we have examples like UiPath that is a robotic uh, uh, platform and they are coming with their own platform. So what we believe is that uh, and the, is that Euro can become the, the leader of this new wave of platforms. So I, uh, we, we want to put the focus of Europe uh, uh, on this new wave of innovation. We want to move from the digital startups into the digital and hardware 
startups with their own mm. platform. We want to move from a startups who have made our life easier, more convenient. You don't have to go to do shopping. You can do online. We can have these meetings instead of having that uh, physical. But which are the problems they have solved? We have a lot of problems mm. in terms of energy. We have a, a, we have even gone back in terms of, of flight and aviation. We, it's taking us longer now to go from Europe to the US than 20 years ago when we had the Concorde. How how I mean, we are talking about so many uh, technological advances, and, and then will you reflect on what is making our life easier? And that's good. We all want to have our life as easy as possible, but in solving our problems, very little. So then we want to move to the next wave, to these uh, new platforms that are uh, platforms related, normally coming from from uh, startups who have a hardware component. Uh, 90, sorry, uh, 84 percent of these deep tech startups have a hardware component. Also, other startups that in the 94 percent of the cases are addressing some of the sustainable development goals. So we are talking about cases like uh, Celeros, Hyperloop to have these new sustainable ways of, uh, of mobility. We are talking about the startups working in the area of hydrogen or deep uh, geothermal energy that has the promise to generate limitless and uh, uh, sustainable green uh, uh, the, uh, energy for, for all. So we, we need to move into this new, and the same happens in construction or in agri-tech or in food tech. So we want Europe to become the leaders on, on this. The digital startups are fine, are there. We in Europe, we missed that wagon 20 years ago. We need to ensure that we don't miss this new wagon. Uh, for, uh, as an example, as a data, in, in the, uh, you know that Europe is quite bad in terms of getting funding for uh, digital startups. It's only 7%, 7, 8%, depending on the year. However, when we go to the, uh, to the energy startups, so, with a hardware component, we go, go to more than 30%. Actually, we become the leaders. Everybody, American investors, Asian investors, Bill Gates, everybody is coming to Europe to invest in the energy startups. So we mm. in Europe, we should, it's fine that they can, but we should ensure that they, 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 if, possible, if they want, and we offer them good uh, platforms, a good ecosystem, they stay in Europe. And the, the, the data is promising. Uh, you may have heard about the two exits or two big rounds of investments. One in Klarna is a fintech uh, uh, startup from Sweden, and another is the North Vol, it's a batteries from Sweden as well. The first one, I don't remember now, was two, three billion uh, euros who hit, they, they raised. All the investors were Americans and Chinese. The second one, mm. the one on batteries, all the it was 10 billion. So three or four order of magnitudes bigger than the, the fintech one. And all the investors were Europeans. And we are talking about uh, investors who normally don't invest in startups. We are talk about, talking about pension funds. The pension fund of Sweden invested in North Ball, but not in, uh, in Klarna. The, the, foundation, the largest foundation from Italy invested in the batteries startup, in the hardware startup, and not in the digital one, uh, Bosch from Germany. So, all the investors, except one who was American, all the other ones were Europeans. What does it mean? What does it take to, uh, to us? That maybe in this case, the European investors, the people, the organizations with the with the with the capital needed to 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 put 10 billion euros on on this kind of startups, they are willing to put this money because they believe in this kind of startups who have a hardware company and who are solving real problems that we have. Hmm. Yeah, and it's, I suppose it's related to a, a theme which has sort of um, recurred a few times throughout today, really, which is that um, every company is a technology company now as well, isn't it? And um, and that relates to what um, Dr. Um, Safa Usli was saying before, which is um, taking a sort of a horizontal as well as a vertical approach to, to, to regulation. Um, Antonio, um, from, from, from your perspective, um, what, what does that mean in terms of the importance of a coordinated approach to, to, to regulating technology and tech companies? What needs to be done to, 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 to create greater sort of harmonization around the, the way that we regulate um, technology and tech companies in a way that, that's beneficial for innovation in society? Another million dollar question for you. Yeah, another million dollar question and 30 seconds to answer, I suppose. So conscious of time, I'll try to be very quick. Uh, many others have already pointed to 
put their fingers on, on, on the relationship between, I think, innovation and regulatory environment. I mean, you know, we know that regardless of whether the innovator is European, North American, Asian, or from other parts of the world, the regulatory environment in which they operate is, is a, it's an important element when it comes to incentives to innovate. It's not a coincidence that a lot of innovators bloom in low regulated uh, um, uh, jurisdictions. Uh, now, so that, that I, won't, I won't touch so, too much of that. I think it's important, uh, a coordinated approach is important because uh, digital economy is complex and it's, uh, it's very fast moving, it's very dynamic, it changes constantly. So it's very important that governments do share views, do share ideas, uh, to minimize errors that are sometimes inevitable in, 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 in regulating a sector. You don't want to be in 10 years' time uh, having to uh, um, live in a world where the regulatory solutions are developed in all different directions uh, and, and businesses are, are incurring a very high cost uh, of compliance. I mean, that's the, the link with, with incentives. I mean, compliance uh, with regulatory, different and di many and many different regulatory regime can be quite detrimental in providing that Sort of environment, business environment would help blooming the startups and, and, and all those uh, innovators that we've been discussing so far. So I leave it at that. I know it's time is up. So back to you, Ben. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Antonio. Um, yeah, we, we are pretty much out of time, but I thought perhaps it might be nice to just um, finish off with a quick round of, of a very quick question for each of you and the same question. I've been to hear your view about what, how sort of optimistic are you about the prospects for. Um, future sort of increased cooperation and communication around um the regulation of technology it, it seems like we're, there's a, there's people just talk of a sort of a, a cold war um and a time when protectionism is is sort of is still sort of with us um for a variety of reasons but are, are you optimistic that, that that things are going to get better in terms of um, the ability of, of regions to to communicate better about um, how to work together on technology and its regulation optimistic very or, or not so optimistic um dr safat uh, yeah, that question pardon pardon me are you okay to answer this question i just thought i'd check uh basically yes we are optimistic actually uh as turkey uh, we are defending the idea that uh, everything will be based on the multilateral uh, level and uh, somehow we should gather the uh, business into the pot as well and also we have to find a way to support uh, the mechanism to startups uh, and uh, uh, either this way or that way we have to regulate internationally and the national level uh, uh, with the jurisdictions and the, all the regulations uh, so basically uh, uh, in short, uh, we uh, we are optimistic uh, to the future. We don't Thank see you so that much, there will be <laughs> Perfect. It's good to hear. Thank you. Let's hope not. And um, and, and Isidro, in, in in short, we're 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 running out of time. So sorry to 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 pressure. But um, how optimistic are you? Would you say on this issue? Well, we have always to be optimistic, no. And the other thing is the, the reality, and then we will have to see is a lot of power balances. And the area of digital is clear balance towards one side, and it's creating the, the big tech companies. And in Europe, we are more on regulating them. And in the future, we will have a more balanced distribution of, of these uh, innovative companies that might be also be uh, reflected in a, in a more balanced uh, equilibrium of uh, collaboration in terms of, of regulation. So I think both things go back and back. You hear now in the EU a lot about the tech sovereignty. That is something that didn't exist before. And I suppose this, I mean, I'm sure this will have a, an impact also in the in the approach towards regulation as well. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Annalisa, is the future bright? <laughs> Are you optimistic? Well, um... I'm optimistic on the effort <laughs> because, well, yeah, I mean, given the strong uh, cross-border effect of uh, of digital economy, it is clear that focus on domestic domain is not enough. We can talk about cyber or AI or, or whatever. And, well, we are all part of global economy with uh, global supply chains and uh, can all benefit from further market uh, integration, also regulatory cooperation. So, yeah, optimistic. Perfect. Thank you so much, and Antonio. 
how optimistic are, is the OECD? How, how optimistic are you about um, your, your job? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I like Annalisa's expression of optimistic on the efforts. Uh, certainly, we've seen mm. uh, a great desire to share views and experiences. Uh, so I like to think that I like to see the glass half full. Um, I mean, you're right. I mean, I've heard national champions, protectionism. It's, of course, there's a lot of that also involved in this uh, equation. But uh, uh, one thing that I, li I liked about the whole process is that cooperation was not just between jurisdictions, but also between different policy makers and different policy areas. There's no one area that can have the solution to these uh, issues and concerns, whether it's competition, consumer protection, privacy, uh, cybersecurity. And so this, this uh, trend towards cooperation between different policy makers makes me feel a little bit more optimistic. Thank you so much, Antonio. So um, <clears throat> things could get better, we hope. <laughs> And thank, thank you so much to, to, to all, of, all of you for your expertise. We're greatly honoured to have you here today and to all of the other speakers today. Um, thank you so much for your time and hope to see you again um, at a future RAID event, the next event planned for the 14th of June in Paris or Brussels, we hope. So um, hopefully see you there. <laughs>